In this video, I'd like to take a look at some properties of functions that are represented by power series. So I think we understand power series pretty well up to this point, and we understand that some x's will make your series converge, and some x's will make your series diverge. And you can collect the x's that make your series converge in what's known as an interval of convergence. And so for those x's that are in your interval of convergence, that means your function is defined there. Those x's are part of the domain of that function. So let's say we have a function that is defined as a power series, and let's say that somehow we find that he has a radius of convergence of, we'll call it r. And so you can deviate up to r units away from the center, and the power series will still converge. Graphically, it looks kind of like this. You have your uh, center, which this one pretty clearly is centered at C, and you can go R units above C and R units below C, and that'll make this the interval of convergence, C minus R up to C plus R. And then here's a, a property of a, a function represented by a power series. If this is your interval of convergence, then this theorem here says that our function will be continuous and differentiable on the interval of convergence. So we can actually take its derivative, and that's not, that's not that obvious. It's not really that, that clear why that's true, but this theorem says that, that it's true, that we can differentiate a power series at least on this interval of convergence. So let's, let's think about this. How, how would you take a derivative of a power series? Well, here's, here's what we do. Think of this guy kind of like an infinitely long polynomial. Now, I know it's not really a polynomial because polynomials have a finite degree, and this goes to infinity. I understand that. But think of it as a, a very long sum. You'd have a sub 0, then you'd have a sub 1 plus a sub 1 x minus c to the first plus a sub 2 x minus c squared plus a sub 3 x minus c cubed for forever. And so when you're taking a derivative, let's differentiate just each individual term. Let's think about that. So the a sub n will be like a constant. The x is the only variable and you're raised to the constant power. The n is either three or four or five or something like that. But the x is the only variable here. So what we could do is we would have a sum and don't fill in the index yet. We'll, we'll talk about the index in just a second. Um, but as far as the individual terms go, we would use the power rule, or actually technically the, the chain rule because there's these layers here, but we'd use the power rule so the n would come down. It would be times a sub n x minus c x minus c to the n minus one, because we decrease the power of n by one. Think of it as like x minus five cubed, for example. We would bring the three down, we'd have x minus five squared, for example. Now, with the chain rule, we should follow this by, with the derivative of the inside, but the derivative of the inside is just one. I don't think there's really any reason to write that. Okay, so then the last question is, what, what is our index? Is it, is it still zero to infinity? Well, it's actually not. And so think about this for a minute. If n equals zero for the very first term, you would have a sub zero, and then you'd have x minus c to the zero, but that's one. So the very first term in this very long sum would be a sub zero. But when you take the derivative, what's the derivative of a constant? Well, a zero. So in effect, we lose the zeroth term. So we would actually start our uh, summation n equals one to infinity. So remember that when you're taking a derivative, you lose the constant term, you lose the first term. So your series starts at one, not zero. All right, but uh, pretty much the, uh, the rest of it is the, just the power rule. Bring the n down, a sub n, x minus c to the n minus one. Okay, now how about the integral? How, how could you take the integral of something like this? Well, you basically do the reverse. You would have a sum. You'd have a sub n x minus c to the n plus one. You remember for the power rule, you add one to the exponent divided by n plus one. 
Okay, so that's fairly clear. But now what about the index for this guy? For the derivative, we increased it by one. For the integral, should we decrease it by one? Should we like start this guy at negative one or something like that? No, I think that's a bad idea because if we started it at negative one, your first term would have division by zero. So we actually don't start it at negative one. We actually keep it at zero. But then that doesn't sound very fair. Why, why did we adjust the index for the derivative but not for the integral? Well, we actually do get an additional term with the integral, but what, where is that extra term coming from? Well, you remember uh, from earlier in your Calc 1 class, when you do an indefinite integral, what are you always supposed to put at the end? You're supposed to put a plus C, right? That constant of integration. That's where the extra term comes in. So rather than backing up your series to get an additional term and starting it at negative one, instead you just leave it at zero and you tack on your extra term with the plus C here. Now the last thing I'll mention is just a couple quick notes uh, regarding the derivative and the integral of a power series is uh, regarding the radius and interval of convergence. How are these affected or are they not affected when we take a derivative or an integral or whatnot? Well, the good news is, is that the radius of convergence is not affected. It's the same for the derivative and the integral. So if your uh, original function had a radius of convergence of four, then the derivative, the new power series, will have a radius of convergence of four, and the integral will have a radius of convergence of four. The only thing that might be messed up slightly is the interval of convergence. Now you say, well, Devin, if the radius of convergence is the same and the center is the same, wouldn't that have to make the interval of convergence the same? Actually, no, because where the difference might happen is at the endpoints. And so you probably remember when we were uh, searching for interval of convergence, you had to test the endpoints separately. And so for these guys, your original function might converge at the endpoints and the derivative might not, the that, uh, derivative's power series might not converge at the endpoints. So you might have some discrepancies there at the endpoints, but at the very least, the radius of convergence for the derivative and for the integral will be the same as for the original function.